Okay, so carrying on with the spreadsheet from yesterday, you can see here, here's the column of our parameters. And very important for your density contrast is to make sure that it's the density of the body, so in our case, it's a uh, cavity full of water, minus the density of the surrounding rock. So your density contrast should be a minus value. It should not be a positive value. So it's the density of the body, which is the cavity, which is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, minus the density of the surrounding rock. Okay, and does everybody know how to create a plot in Excel? Just in case you don't, the easiest way I do it is I highlight all the x values and I highlight sorry, all the y values and you just go insert up at the top. I chose a scatter plot and I chose the dots with a line connecting it just so you can see what it looks like. And if I click on it, it automatically plots it on the screen in front of me. <clears throat> I'm going to just move this to a separate sheet so that we can easily play around with it. Okay. Okay. Does anybody remember how we co converted from meters per second as the unit to milligals? We spoke about it yesterday. Ten to the negative five. Yeah, I think you are right. Um, so I would like you to have a separate column at the bottom that is in milligals because that's the standard unit, and so it's this um, divided by 10 to the minus 5. All right. Let's see. Okay. It just, because you can see our values are very small, you've got like 10 to the minus 10 and 10 to minus 11, so it helps make them not as small. And if you could actually go back to your chart and change your values that you're plotting because you're currently plotting in meters per second rather plotted in milligals. So how you do that is you literally just go to your chart, click on a blank area, right click on a blank area, go select data, and then it shows you what data is it using in the spreadsheet. And it's called series one. I go edit, and it's currently using B3 to AP3 and D. So these are the rows that it's using. I'm going to change the Y values to rather use the milligal column because that's more precise for gravity. I told you it'd be an Excel expert by the end. Okay, and you can see now the values are not so bad. We've got minus 0 0.3, minus 0 0.8. These are more reasonable values to work with instead of minus times 10 to the 6. So try putting in a column for me underneath that is in milligals, you literally just take your previous value and divide it by 10 to the minus 5. Okay, so you can see in this figure, we've got a profile, so we went out into the field and we did a one kilometer profile. And it was as the gentleman you were pointing out yesterday, did we need to do a one kilometer profile? Because it took us the whole day, it was a lot of work, I was tired. <laughs> um, and you can see, if we had skipped out all of these points at the beginning and all these points at the end, we still would have found this anomaly here. So it was a bit of a waste of time. But the problem when you go out into the field is you never actually know what's there. And so very often you do just have to do a one kilometer profile. But maybe somebody drilled a borehole and you knew approximately where the body was. Then you could reduce the size of your profile. And I mean, I would have said you could have done it from minus 200 to 200. And the reason being is you want to make sure you get down to the background values of close to zero. Whereas if we had stopped maybe here at, min at 50 or minus 50, we still would have been on the anomaly. So you want to get to the background values. Um, was how often you took a measurement. So I, I asked you to calculate it every 50 or 25 meters. Was that enough? Do you think, uh, well, let me show you, for example, say I said to you, let's rather calculate it every 100 meters. So there's minus 500, and then I'm going to do minus 400, minus 300, and let me drag it along until we get to 300 on this side. Oh, sorry, wrong way. 
Okay, till we get to 500 on this side. Oh, sorry. Okay, there we are. Almost. Okay. Okay, let's look now what our anomaly looks like. So we've got, we've got minus 500, 500, 100 meter spacing. Are we still going to see this anomaly, or what's it going to look like? Let me actually, if you bear with me for two seconds. No, it's not going to let me go backwards. Let me do this. So we can plot both of them and compare them. Okay, minus 65, minus 475, minus 450. Let's go this way. Okay, sorry about the waste of time. But it will just help prove a point. So add, add here, hopefully this works. Okay, you can see how different they are. So this blue line is if we do a measurement every 100 meters, red is if we did a measurement every 25 meters. And so you can see your anomaly is going to be quite different. And so what we'll learn as we go forward with today is that a, a broader anomaly either means that your body's um, got a higher density. So you might think, oh, there's some different mineral here because it's a, a broader anomaly. You might think the body's bigger. So you might go on the stock market and say, we found a, a full body however wide, a kilometer wide, instead of 500 meters wide. So it might change the price. So you can see how much that affects it. But our day was shorter. We got to go home earlier because we were taking much less measurements. So these are factors you've got to take into account. Ideally, you could take a measurement every five meters, and you'd get a much better idea of what the anomaly looks like. But that would cost you two days of working. So it's a trade-off. And that's what you, if you do geophysics honors next year, you actually have to plan a bit when you do the field school of how many stations I'm going to do, how much is it going to cost me, how many days is it going to work, and then put forward the bid to sue and she's choosing the best bid. Okay, so these are things to take into account when you're planning your survey. How long is your profile? How often are you going to take your measurement? Okay, so you are welcome to save that on your desktop. We are finished with it at the moment. Still no people. Um, okay. okay, the question I forgot to ask you about your anomaly here in Excel is would a gravity meter be able to detect it? And so gravity, gravity meters, um, they can't detect all of them. Obviously, they've got a limit. And so in theory, their limit is 0 0.005 to 0 0.001 milligrams. So anything smaller than that, they can't see. But in real life, it's not quiet when you're out in the field. It's noisy. Maybe the soil isn't very compact, and so the gravity meter moves. Although usually, they need to be very stable. You can't move while it's taking a measurement. Even if the wind blows, it will affect it and increase the error. So realistically, you can measure about 0 0.04 to 0 0.02 milligrams. But anything smaller than that, you won't be able to say is an anomaly. It's just part of the noise. So is our anomaly bigger or smaller than 0 0.04 to 0 0.02? So let's go back to our Excel spreadsheet. So oh, let's just move this out of the way. 0 0.04 to 0 0.02. Yeah, so our anomaly gets as big as 0 0.06. So we should be able to see it. So this is something that we would be able to pick up in the field. So that's something, because you're dealing with very small anomalies with gravity, always got to keep it in mind. Will I actually even be able to detect this in the field? And so, for, for example, one of the students here in Kimo is looking at underground mine operations that are filling with water, so voids, and he's trying to see how deep avoid can he detect because maybe at 20 meters depth the anomaly is so small that he can't picture it. So this is something you just got to keep in mind when you're doing gravity. Okay, so back to the PowerPoint. Just to give you an idea, we've been dealing with a sphere and the profile over the sphere, but mostly you want to deal with things in 3D. So how, what does the anomaly look like in 3D? Instead of just one line over the um, the body, 
you would set up a grid that you would measure across all of them. And the equation is exactly the same, except your value in the base here, we had um, x squared plus z squared to the 3 over 2. You would then also have a y value in the base. So it just makes your calculations a bit more complicated. And you can also, well, say, for example, in the area where we are um, doing our survey, there's a layer of very dense material, and the layer goes throughout the area. We never get to the edges of the layer. Do you think we're going to see that on a gravity uh, uh, survey? Do you think we're going to pick up an anomaly if it's all throughout the whole area? I agree with you. Why do you think not? Yes, you can think of it that way. Because you're never reaching the edge of the body, and that's actually what we find in we're looking for in geophysics. Geophysics, you're looking for a contrast, so a change in values. And we just saw that in our calculations. We weren't looking at a density value, we were looking at a change in density values. And so if I've got a body of rock throughout this whole area, I never notice a change because it's always there. And so if you've got this, like a sheet throughout your survey area, and your, maybe your gravity values will be higher, but it will be higher everywhere. So it's more like a vertical shift in your data. So you're not really going to use gravity to find a, a, a body of rock that is throughout your area. If you knew that the edge of this body of rock was in your area, then you would be able to measure the change across this, um, this edge of the rock. And that's kind of here what you can see is that this is your body of rock, or it's also a sill. So for those who've done geology, it's if the magma intrudes into the body of rock as a flat surface, it's called the sill. And so here's the edge of the sill. You're going to pick up a change in gravity. So there's a low on, sorry, I need a point here so that it's recorded on the video. There's, there's a low on the western side, on the left side, and it obviously increases because we've got the sill. And you can see as well, the shallowest sill has a sharper anomaly, whereas this deeper sill has a more uh, gradual anomaly. And even the gravity value is a bit lower for the deeper sill, obviously because it's not as close to the surface. So you're not going to measure as high a gravity. Um, and this is what we looked at yesterday, that you can even measure the gravity over irregular bodies. <clears throat> and in that case, it's, you're just calculating the gravity to, to, due to a small part of the body and then adding them all together. And so, in general, some rules to keep in mind. So, here we've got a shallow pink body um, that's got a positive density contrast in pink. And we've got a body with a negative density contrast. It's in blue and that's why there's the negative signs. And so, this brown on top is, they've just taken the plot that you've done and colored it in brown. And so over the pink body, oh, sorry, we've got this uh, positive peak, and then over the negative body, this negative anomaly like we've seen now. And some things to keep in mind, um, and they're quite intuitive. So higher average density bodies will always cause a positive, and we've said that already. Um, with the amplitude being proportional to the density in excess. And that's what we've said already. If it's a more dense rock, it's obviously going to have a bigger peak over it. Next point here, lower than average density bodies will always cause a negative gravity anomaly. We've also said that. Let's see. The aerial extent of an anomaly will reflect the dimensions of the body causing it. So obviously if I've got a bigger body, I'm going to have a broader anomaly or a larger anomaly. So if I've got a small sphere, I'm going to have a little peak over it. Because if I've got a big sphere, it's going to be a much broader anomaly. So these are just observations you can make when seeing the data. A sharp high frequency anomaly will generally indicate a shallower body, and a broader low frequency anomaly will generally what, indicate a deep body. And that's exactly what we saw here, is that here you've got a high frequency anomaly, it's much sharper, it's indicating a shallower body. Here you've got this broader low frequency anomaly indicating a deeper body. So just some general rules to keep in mind when you're doing work gravity. And the edges of the body will tend to lie under inflection points on the gravity profile. So you can see here, it's um, this edge here is not 100%. Um, this edge here of the anomaly that changes, this change in slope, usually correlates with the edge of the body. 
Okay, so in the field, this is what a gravity meter looks like. Small box, very uncomfortable to carry. They're quite heavy. Um, and so each station takes about five to ten minutes to record. So it's not as quick as magnetics where you can just walk and take measurements while you're going along. You also need to have a GPS with you. And it's not just a normal GPS, it's called a DGPS. And that means differential GPS. And really what that means is instead of having a small handheld unit with you, you have a much bigger unit on a pole and there's a base station. And the reason why there's a base station is it helps correct for errors introduced by the atmosphere and other errors. And as a result, instead of having a GPS, a handheld GPS that can get you a point accurate to centimeters or meters, this differential GPS, your measurement that you make is accurate to millimeter level. And you need this millimeter level accuracy to do your gravity corrections, or else your gravity won't be very accurate. So you take a measurement of the gravity pe peg. These are just some of the steps. You've got to level the tripod. We'll take out the gravity meter next week and do a quick measurement. Um, and so, yeah, you're going to make uh, recordings along the way. There's also several different types of uh, gravity meters and, so, and different ways to measure G. And so you can either have use a falling object, but that's quite a primitive way of doing it, of measuring gravity. And you can use a pendulum, or you can use a spring balance. And a spring balance is what we use in the modern gravity meters. You can see you've got a spring here with a mass on it, and that obviously if it goes to, to an area where there's this body down here that's got excess mass, it's going to attract this small mass towards it, and you're going to measure the small change in G, and it's going to extend the spring. And so that's what your gravity meter is really showing you. Uh, it is very sensitive, and so you can see the temperature of the spring is imp uh, important because it can actually affect the length of the spring. And so it's kept constant, the temperature, by keeping it in a vacuum. And it actually also, you can't walk with the gravity meter unless it's switched off. Because as soon as you switch it off, it locks the spring in place. Whereas if you're walking around and it's bouncing around, it can actually damage the spring. But it's also a spring, so it's going to slowly drift, and so it's going to slowly extend, um, and so you've actually got to take that into account when you do your corrections when you're in the field. You'll see that if you plot your gravity measurements over the day, there'll be the slow increase in values, and it's not because of the rocks, it's actually because the spring is um, extending. So you've just got to take that into account. But the main thing we do surveys for, uh, re more recently, is microgravity surveys. And like I mentioned to you, and Chemo is looking at mine workings and these um, voids that are left over, because a lot of the mines in the gold fields are abandoned nowadays. They haven't recorded where they mined, and there's a lot of sinkholes that form it. And maybe government wants to form a, a new um, housing project in the area. We need to know if it's safe or not. And so you can use geophysics to map out these mine areas, map out caves. So up by Sturfantine and Rising Star, where they found the new um, bones for Homer and the Lady, they're actually using gravity to map out where the cave system is, and also environmental. So Sue was doing a project mapping how much water was in an area, so the aquifers in a region, um, because there were lots of trees there that seemed to be sucking up a lot of the water. Uh, like these type of surveys are very accurate, so you've got to do very small um, gravity measurements. Your values are about 0 0.005 to 0 0.1. So you even have to make sure you're facing in the same direction every time you make a measurement. So you, oh, sorry, that's okay. So small things like that can even change your gravity measurements. Small station spacing, so instead of our 25 meter spacing, here you've got one to five meter spacing, so very closely spaced. Um, like I said, you need uh, your height measurements are accurate to millimeters, and these you very often repeat every year if you're looking for water to see how the water changes. Okay, this is an example of what a survey area would look like. So these black dots are your survey points. The distance between them is called the station spacing, and obviously the distance between each line is called the line spacing. And you have a base station. <coughs> so in the morning, you go take a measurement at your base station with your gravity meter. It's usually on a very hard rock surface, so that the measurement is a constant. You don't have the soil changing um, height. And then what happens, gravity, you go out and you make measurements for about three hours. 
and then you go back and take another base station reading. And the reason is because I told you about this drift. And so if I take a measurement at the base station in the morning, I take measurements for three hours and slowly my values are increasing because of the drift in the instrument. If I go back to the base station, I can check, well, the base station measurement was here in the morning and it's increased after three hours. I can just put a straight line to the curve and minus out that straight line. Yes? No. So it's in the middle because it's usually easier to get to then from everywhere, but maybe your rocks are on the side and then you just have to go, yeah, it just means more walking um, on one day compared to the other. So the middle is usually easier just to get to, but it depends where your rocks are and depends where your survey is. And you can even do surveys over several weeks and then I'm not going to travel 20 kilometers to come back to my base station every three hours. And so what they have is multiple base stations then and they link them to each other. So it's a lot more complicated, but it can be done. There's also something called a loop. So for example, say um, I went and made these measurements in three hours. Maybe I was a bit slow. I also then go back to my base station, which is I'm assuming is this circle here. And then I go in the next three hours and make another loop here. And I repeat a measurement here. Now, let me just expand here because I think I've done it. Okay, so what we need to do are internal and external checks. And all that means is you're repeating measurements so that you can go to your client who's paying you at the end of the day and say, well, I did these two measurements at the same spot and they're very close to each other. So obviously my, my results are quite accurate. And you actually have to do several measurements and actually present it to the client so he knows how well you've done your work. An internal check is when you repeat a measurement within a loop. So say I did my base station measurement down here. I went and did this loop here. I think the, the blue is a, is a loop. And then I, re I get to the end of my loop. Before I go back to my base station, I take this measurement a second time. So I took it the first time around when I was going in this circle, and then when I came around this side again, I took it a second time. And so I can compare those two. An external check is once I've gone back to my base station a second time, I then go and I start this red loop here. And I go here, and I repeat these two measurements that I did earlier in the day. And so I can compare them as well. But then I also do the second loop, well, I carry on this red loop, and I repeat this measurement. This is an internal check here because it's the same red measurement. It's a repeated red measurement, whereas where your red and your blue overlap, that's an external check because it was done in a loop earlier on in the day. And you actually have to do both sets of measurements and present both to the client. Your external checks are going to be slightly worse. Your results will be slightly worse because it was at a different time of day and so it makes it a little bit worse. And so this is, instead of doing a basic survey going up and down, up and down, you can actually, supposedly this is a more efficient way of doing your loops in this um, grid. Okay. Very important in geophysics, always go in a direction that is 90 degrees to where you think your anomaly is. So it wasn't so important for us because we had a sphere in our previous example, but say, for example, I've got it dark, so when magma intrudes upwards, it forms a long line. Um, I would want to go at 90 degrees to it because you get your best results from gravity. You always want to be at 90 degrees to wh uh, where your body is. How often do we measure? We've actually spoken about this earlier with the Excel spreadsheet. If in this example down here, I took a measurement at these red triangles, I would completely miss this peak. I would have measured this value, this value here, and that one down here, and my curve, I think I've got a line, would have looked like that. So my station spacing here, or my sampling rate, would have been far too high. And that's when you come up with a problem called aliasing. And it literally means you've lost some of your anomaly because your station spacing wasn't small enough. And so you need to calculate something called the Nyquist frequency, and so this is the minimum rate at which your signal can be sampled without introducing errors. So it really just means how often you need to sample to pick up that whole anomaly. And it's equal to two times the highest frequency present in your signal. So we'll, I'll show you a quick calculation. 
And so ideally you want to sample at these blue triangles so that you can get the full curve going along. Yes. <sighs> Miss it. Then you don't know there's anything there. So, I mean, if a company is trying to say to you, like, I want to mine in this area, show me where all the ore bodies are, and you do a spacing too big, you would just say to them, oh, there's one over here, but you miss, might miss the other one over there. So, I mean, technically they don't know that it's there anyway, so you wouldn't get into trouble. But if they're drilling in the area as well, um, and they know that there's hit something there, but your map doesn't show there's an anomaly there, they might start to doubt your ability as a geophysicist. Was that your question? Oh, sure. Um, okay, so the big problem, though, is the cost. Because you literally you could go in between these blue triangles and get an even better curve, but it's going to take you a lot longer and cost a lot more, so the client might not choose you because you're too expensive. Okay, so Nyquist frequency, this is a very roundabout calculation, and in the end, there's a quicker way, but I'll just show you. So, to calculate the Nyquist frequency, it's two times the highest frequency present in your signal. So, say, for example, the shortest wavelength is 3 meters. So, the shortest wavelength anomaly is 3 meters. So, we're going to convert wavelength into frequency, and we know wavelength is equal to C times uh, C divided by the frequency, the frequency is equal to C divided by wavelength, and so um, C is the speed of light, correct? <coughs> Sorry. Divided by the wavelength, so we get a frequency of about 1 times 10 to the 8 um, seconds to minus 1. And so your Nyquist frequency is 2 times your highest frequency. The Nyquist frequency is 2 times 10 to the 8, and then you obviously want to put it back um, into... Oh, you want to convert the Nyquist frequency into wavelength. So to me, wavelength makes more sense. That's why in this example, I converted from wavelength to wavelength. Um, and so ultimately, the Nyquist wavelength is equal to this... Uh, I'm confused. Oh, it's this Nyquist frequency. Sorry. No, no, no. I've got, sorry, it's the speed of light divided by your Nyquist frequency gets you back to 1.5 meters. So technically, very roundabout way of saying your shortest wavelength is 3 meters. Sample it at about half of the shortest wavelength. So the shortest wavelength is 3 meters, so you want to take a measurement about every 1.5 meters. And so um, back here, if this was 3 meters is your wavelength, you would literally sample here on top of the peak and on this side would be your, at your Nyquist frequency. And there, you wouldn't get the best plot that would show you a line like that. But you would still know there's a problem there. So your minimum number that you can do is at your Nyquist frequency, so it's three. But ideally, you should add in two more, and it will give you a much better idea of what the, the anomaly looks like. So that's to keep in mind about how often you should sample. Okay, that's just another example down there. If that's your wavelength, you're going to plot the, you're going to sample on the blue squares, but again, your, your anomaly you come up with is going to be a horribly jagged blue line, but it's still at least showing you the anomalies there. Um, just before we move on, you, we're not going to go into more detail with it, but you'll see it in those notes that I gave you. When you do gravity, and we've spoken about it before, there's several corrections you have to make to the data. Um, there's, we mentioned already, this drift correction because of the spring a latitude correction because of where you are on the Earth. A free air correction is actually due to changes in height because we said if you're at a higher height, your gravity is, your, the pull of gravity is less because you're further away from the center of the Earth. And then this Bouguet correction, you're actually correcting um, for the density of rock surrounding you and you're taking away the background density of rock so that you're left with just what is due to the bodies in the subsurface that you are interested in, so these anomalous bodies. So this is just so that you know this when you hit the honors next year, you're not surprised. Okay, so in summary, because we're going to just use some of the other software quickly, uh, you can really read all of this yourself, but gravity surveys measure, yeah, I'm going to give you the things and then you can read these at home, because else it's just me reading for you. 
Okay. And so now that we're going to briefly look at using Grav 2DC software, so it saves you having to make these Excel calculations, although you're all experts at it now, we're going to use Grav 2DC, but you need to understand what are you putting into Grav 2DC. And so gravity is very good for measuring certain geological situations. And for example here, the first one is a change in overburden. Does anyone know what overburden is? Give us a brief description. Any expert geologist? So it's literally kind of your soil. So it's this red here is your solid rock, and maybe on top the solid rock was weathered away, and now you've got the soil layer, and maybe on the left here it's quite a bit shallower, and it gets thicker going towards the east or towards the right, and so you can measure that change in soil thickness. Second one here is displacements on faults or fractures or structural changes. So again, this red here is the solid rock, this yellow is the overburden, and you can see there's a fault going down the middle here. It's broken. This right-hand side is at a shallower depth. This is down here. And I meant to say, we mentioned earlier, geophysics measures contrasts, so changes. And it's this change here that it's measuring. It's going from this deeper overburden to the shallower overburden. Or you can even say that from the shallower solid rock to this deeper solid rock. There's this change in density here. Another thing you can measure is intrusions. So here's your overburden, red is the solid rock, this green is a dark that's intruded up. Again, you've got a change in density across it, so you're going to pick that up. And what we've kind of been speaking about so far are all, all bodies, so maybe you've got an uh, ellipse in the subsurface and you're measuring this change because over here there's, nothing, there's no all body. As you go over it, you're going to get an increase and there's nothing in the background. So that's, we're looking at a density contrast, but, and it'll make more sense when we do it in Grav 2DC. If this is your model, and maybe this is a dense layer, this P4, and it's, it's faulted over here, and maybe P2 is a low density layer, and also it's faulted over there. When you put in these bodies into the software, you don't have to put a body for P1, P2, P3, P4, P5. All you actually have to do in the software is put in where the density contrast is. So don't worry if it doesn't make sense now, but you literally can put in one body here, one body here, one body there, one body there. So four bodies instead of ten bodies. And instead of giving the, what is the density value of this body, you give what is the density contrast of that body to the background. And so it saves you a bit of time. But I'll show you it in Grav 2DC. Okay, so this is what we're going to work on quickly. Um, we've got an ancient burial chamber uh, is trying to be sought using microgravity. So very similar to what is happening at Rising Star, looking for Homer and Lady and other bones. The chamber has a radius of 4 meters with a covering of up to 3 meters in a material of density of 2,000 kilograms per meters cubed. Estimate the magnitude of the anomaly and what is the suitable grid spacing. And the density of air is 1.225 kilograms per cubic meter, so it's pretty much close to zero. So you can just assume zero. So, um, does anyone want to come draw the model on the board for me? So close to the front, you wouldn't have to walk far. Okay, so similar to that, come draw it on this side. So draw for me the Earth's surface. And we've got a chamber, you can just make a sphere now. And it's got a radius of 4 meters. Okay, it's got a covering of up to 3 meters. So I assume that the covering of up to 3 meters means this, so it's from the top of the sphere to there is 3 meters. So don't forget that you have to, Z in your equation is to the center of the one. So you have to add on 4 meters there. The density of the surrounding material is 2,000 kilograms. Great. Okay, so that's the model we're looking at. Everybody, will you look on your desktop and see if you've got a program called Grab 2 dc Okay. Everybody briefly look here so you know what to do when you get home. So, literally Google 
ResearchGate Grav2DC. So ResearchGate is a website where you can, up, like if I publish a paper, I can upload it there and other people can access it for free. <coughs> or if you have a flash, you can just copy it off the computer. So ResearchGate Grav2DC, the first result that comes up is this Grav2DC 2.5 Grav modeling by ResearchGate. If you click on it, oh, the website that comes up here shows Gordon Cooper. So if anyone knows Gordon Cooper, he's the lecturer next door. So it's software that he's written that measures gravity. You literally go, you scroll down, and the software file is here. It's grav2dc.zip, and you download it. So you can download it at home or take it off of these computers, your choice. Okay. And once you've opened it up, it should look something like this. Have you got it? Okay. So everybody, has anyone used it before? No? Okay. Are you guys okay in the background? Okay. So open up the exe file. And then in the top left corner here, click on System Options. And the first uh, option says Begin a New Model. Okay. And the, the, body, the window that opens here says initial body density. Now we're not actually going to put in a body density, we're going to put in a density contrast. But it's a bit complicated in your model because technically your density contrast is your density. So the density contrast in our model is 0, minus 2000. So it's actually minus 2000 is our answer. But this software works in grams per centimeter cubed. So we're not going to put in minus 2,000, we're going to put in minus 2. Okay, I hope that's right. Strike length. Strike is the distance that a body comes in and out of the page. So we're dealing with a profile here, so we know how long it is on the profile, but we want it to come in and out of the page. So ours only comes in and out of the page four meters because that is its radius. So you can put four here and four. Sure. And it actually needs more explanation. Okay, so strike length um, is just the distance that a body comes up in and out of the page. So our profile is like this. And so you just need to remember that this sphere is a 3D sphere and it's coming out by four meter radius and this four meter radius on the other side. It gets a bit com so your homework assignment deals with a sill or a die, I think it is. And so what happens then is that sills are not so small. They are much like that, much bigger. And so I would remember I would then put a strike length of a thousand. Because you're just trying to say it's a big body that's going in every direction very far. So let this not confuse you later. We're putting in a small value now because we're dealing with a small sphere. But if you're dealing with a big body, you want a bigger strike length because it actually affects your values. Okay, look down here. It says maximum depth display. You can leave it as 100 for now. We'll change it just now. And then on this bottom thing here, it says read in field data. There's a tick next to it. Take it away. We are not going to read in data. We're actually going to create our own model which is called the forward model. Okay, and it says to us, what station spacing do you want? So, I'm not 100% sure at the moment, but I do know we've got a very small body. So, we might want a smaller station spacing. So, maybe let's at the moment do a station spacing of one meter. And so, it's because we're doing a microgravity survey. That's what we've been asked for. And we know the microgravity surveys are one to five meter spacing. So let's be cautious and do one meter spacing. Um, number of points. So obviously if I've got a spacing of one and I've got 100 points, my profile is about 100 meters. And that should be okay because we've only got a four meter body. So we should go over it and see the whole anomaly. And then the units, we're going to put meters because we've got a four meter wide body. Okay, so it should be minus two, four, four, 100, one, 100. No tick and meters. And we click OK. And let's see if this works. I hope I'm right. Okay. 
So it says left button, click on the left button of your mouse to add a corner, right button, bottom, what? Right button to close the corner. Okay, so we're going to actually draw a circle. And um, I'm just trying to look. So I'm going to click OK. You can see here we need a circle that is 8 meters wide. And you can see this between 40 and 50 is 10 meters. So I'm going to approximate it. For now, we're just going to approximate our circle. And it's got to be at a, the top of it must be at a depth of about 3 meters. I've made life a bit difficult by giving us such a big depth scale, but that's fine. So literally, I'm going to click with my left mouse button. I'm going to draw a very bad circle, and we'll fix it up as we go along. Once I've done my last click with my left button, I right-click, and it closes the anomaly. Okay, so click right, left button, click, 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 click in a circle. When you get to the end of it, right-click, and it closes the body, and it should give you an anomaly. So give that a try. No matter what you do, it's not wrong. We can always start over again. Oh, try go in a clock <coughs> clockwise direction when you add your points. It's not so important for gravity, but when we do magnetics, it will have a big effect. Okay. To delete a point, you go to this, the menu at the top, edit the model, and go delete body corner. Click on it. It says to you, use your left button to mark the corner that you don't want right button to close. So click OK. So literally left click on the corner you don't like. It puts an X or a star there. Right click and it disappears. Sometimes it's difficult. If your points are close together, it's going to be hard to see. Maybe something that can help you is to use your If you want, you can actually change your vertical scale. What I recommend for your vertical scale is that you have approximately the same distance as your horizontal scale. So this is 20. Try and make that 20. Because then it doesn't give you any vertical exaggeration. So at the moment, it looks like I'm, I've got a perfect sphere here. But actually, let me just show you. Um, it's actually not a perfect sphere because it's dependent on my value. So I'm double-clicking on this left-hand side here, and I'm going to do a maximum depth display of 50, let's see, and a labeling increment of 10. And so, okay, I'm actually going to do it a bit less. I'm going to do 30. Okay, and so you can see here, this value, this distance here is approximately the same as to this distance here. 20 is about as long as And now you can see it's much more smeared out. And so try and get your scale over here to be the same distance here so you can get a perfect sphere. So everybody double click for me on this left hand side here. Double click. And this depth axis parameter will come up. And change it to 30 as your maximum depth and 10 as the labeling increment. So try now and delete your bad corners. If it's still impossible, you really can just start over again. It's probably easier. If you need to add in a corner, I think you guys at the back there need to add a corner. Very similar. You go edit the model, and underneath delete a corner, you go add a corner to your body. It says in a clockwise sense, indicate the previous corner, then the new corner. So click on a previous corner, and then click where you want to add the new corner. Um, maybe the easier thing. Thank everybody before you waste too much time. Let us all start again. And the easier thing will be to change our depth display from the start. So everybody go back up to system options, begin a new model. Okay, we're going to start again. So go to the top left, go system options, begin a new model. Remember our body density was minus 2, strike length was 4, 4. Now maximum depth display, make it 30. Because then from the start, we can have a perfect sphere. Take away the tick. Change your station spacing to 1. Keep the number of points as 100. And change your units to meters. OK. Once you've done that. OK, we're starting again. Did you guys start again? Oh, OK. Click OK. Let's put a bit more effort in now. 
So we know the top of our body needs to be about 3 meters. So you can even see down here, it gives you your X position and your Z position. So try to start the top of the body around 3 meters. And don't click too many times. I think you guys were too enthusiastic with your clicking. Just a few. It doesn't have to be that perfect a circle. And so try and make a diameter of about 8. I'm just going to do close to 10. And so I'm going to go from a depth of 3 down to a depth of about 13 to try to get a circle. Don't kill yourself trying to make it perfect. Mine's probably too wide, but that's fine. Okay, so starting approximately at the depth of three, going down to it. Um, your homework assignment. So we gonna. It's just so that you can get used to the software. If you have problems, don't stress. We can chat about it next week. So you've got a horizontal sill. So we said that it was magma that had intruded into the rocks as a horizontal layer. That extends well outside the survey area. Um, has a thickness of about 30 meters and a density of 500 kilograms per meters cubed in excess of the rock it intrudes. Estimate the maximum depth at which it would be detectable using a gravity meter that can measure 0 0.1 milligrams. So don't stress, <coughs> it's a lot more complicated than the stuff we've talked about already. So we have a horizontal layer in our area. Obviously, we can't have it throughout the whole area because then you wouldn't notice any difference. So we're going to assume that we're going to see the edge of the sill in our area. So we've got a horizontal layer, we are seeing the edge of it in our area, and this is the sill. Okay, it says to us it's got a thickness of 30 meters. It's got a density of 500 kilograms per meter cubed in excess of the rocket intrudes. So I'm not telling you what the density of it or the other rock is. We just know that this body here is going to have a density contrast of 500 kilograms per meter cubed. Or don't forget, in the software here, it's going to be 0 0.5 grams per centimeter cubed. Estimate the maximum depth at which it would be detectable using a gravity meter. Uh, that can measure 0.1 milligrams. So you've got a gravity meter that can't measure anything smaller than 0.1 milligrams. Anything smaller than that, you're not going to be able to detect. So what you need to do is move this down and tell me when does the anomaly get smaller than 0.1 milligrams. So you should expect to see a curve similar to this. And so when does it become 0.1 milligrams or less? Well, 0.1. Thereabouts. It doesn't have to be exactly zero. But what is this depth value? So you're going to just put in this body here. You can, um, well, you can put in a body like that, and you're just going to play around with moving it up and down. You don't have to play around with the density contrast. You don't have to play around with the thickness. Um, the only thing to remember: your strike is going to be larger. Now we use a strike of only four, now you can use a thousand. Because this body is coming very far out the board and very far into the board. Um, the only other thing is that technically it's also extending very far this way. And if you stop it here, you're actually going to get your body coming down here. You are normally going to have any shivers. It needs to keep going. So you're going to have to use. Um, let's just do it quickly. It's up. Sorry. Seriously. There you are. Um, you can actually go here, edit the model, change a corner numerically. So this is the current body that's highlighted. So you kind of got to figure it out. So the current horizontal distance is 29. Previous corner is 28, 26. So you've got to figure out which corners you're dealing with. Um, I think this corner here is this top left hand one. If I make this minus a thousand and I click calculate, it shoots off far. So just use this tool to be able to just make this extend far off screen. I said minus a thousand, so minus five hundred, your choice, just to get it 
to go far off, and then the previous corner also needs to go far off. Okay, because it's going to affect what your curve looks like. So do this, um, save it, and save it as a .mod file, and then email it to me. We, oh, we don't have lectures next week. We have lectures the following week. So, do you have a stressful weekend? Can you do it this weekend? Or do you want time as well next week? You can email me if you're having any troubles. Please email me. This video of how to use the software, I've got several videos on YouTube. I'll also send you those links.